Hello everyone, very warm welcome this evening and we're going to talk about costume of course. I am a theatre director, um, I was a freelance director and then an associate at the National Theatre and still am and I've just taken over as artistic director at Theatre Royal Stratford East um, and I was asked by Tom to be here today and I was like oh great I'll just chat like I do, I always chat, oh it's not about me, I'm chairing. <laughs> so uh, maybe we could just introduce ourselves. So Peter, I have to declare I've worked with two wonderful people on this panel. So Peter. Hi, I'm Peter McIntosh, a set and costume designer. Hi, I'm Holly, and Holly Waddington, and I'm a costume designer prim primarily, sometimes through set design, but most of the time costume designer. Great. Hi, I'm Claire Wilcox, I'm a curator at Victoria and Abbott Museum, and I also teach at London College of Fashion. Thanks. And I'm Katrina Lindsay, and I do set and costume design as well. So I just thought we'd start with the basics <coughs> and just ask you how you all began. What was that first seed? Maybe towards art in general, but then very specifically towards um, your career here now, today. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Katrina, do you want to start? Uh, <laughs> Shouldn't have looked at me. Uh, uh, well, I always knew I wanted to go to art college, so that was kind of, I don't know, I just liked painting, drawing, and so I, I went to art college, and I'd always sort of performed the, in theatre, so, um, you know, they were my two interests, really, but I hadn't, I didn't, we didn't have anything called theatre design when I was at school that we studied, so I didn't really know much about it. Um, and then I went to uh, Art Foundation, and it was during the Art Foundation that I did a, a sort of module on theatre design, and it just all clicked, actually. It all just made a lot of sense to me. And I think it was definitely the right decision. It was, you know, I, I, it, what I like about theatre design is that it involves so many different disciplines and, um, you know, levels of research. It's sort of, it just, it's never, ever boring. It's always... Um, you know, it's always very interesting and there's always uh, like new things that you're learning. Um, and then when I left college, so I did the degree and, and when I left college, one of the things that I think I was always interested in was making, being a theatre maker, so not just a designer. So I sort of had spoken to my tutor about this and that I wanted to be part of a company that was starting out and making theatre. So um, I got a phone call in the summer and they need, you know, some group of actors needed a designer to take a show to Edinburgh so I got involved in that and it, uh, it was a show that we did at the Richard DeMarco Gallery and it, it won a Fringe first and it got taken up by the British Council to tour so I then spent a kind of year and a half touring with this great, you know, with no, we didn't have any money but I could go to, we went to Romania and Hong Kong and America and I could do all these installations in these different spaces and so for me, it was just, it was really that kind of realisation that I wanted to make theatre, I wanted to be part of the process, I wanted to be around actors. That was kind of quite a strong instinctive drive that I had quite early on. Um, so I carried on doing that for about a year and a half, and then this group had, um, had been sort of set up by this guy called Brian Asprey, who had gone around a lot of the drama colleges and you know, was basically saying to graduates, don't wait for other people to give you jobs. Mm. You should be creating your own work, you know, get together with your contemporaries and make pieces of theatre. And they found this space in Paddington. And so when I came back, um, the next kind of group were coming through. And one of those people coming through was Rufus Norris, who, uh, who was an actor at the time, but wanted to direct a show and was looking for a designer. So then Rufus and I sort of met and, I designed his first show and and then through that we set up a company and then we had a company for quite a long time and also I was doing kind of other starting to branch out and do other kind of small scale theatre design projects um, and then Rufus and I have always kept working together so we've had a long relationship of you know I suppose I don't know don't put a date years. on it <laughs> a long time, a long time. Uh, yeah and um, and one of the shows that he asked me to do was this was after working a long time was um, a show in America because uh, he wanted somebody that he knew to come along and in America they divide the roles between costume and set and that's where I kind of started focusing on costume, costume actually right. um, and and after that because it, it did very well and my work did very well there 
I kind of got known as somebody who sort of specialises in costume and so I started being offered kind of big costume shows um, and, and, and actually really, I really love being able to sometimes just concentrate on costume and character and um, that side of, of the work. So that's kind of how it's all just unfolded for me. That's yeah. brilliant. Thank yeah. you, Katrina. A different, yeah, a different... Yeah, so different. Um, I was at school, I was studying history of art and English and, my, and art, and my art teacher said, you need to go to this place called the National Art Library, it's a place called the DNA. And I went along to the library in my school uniform and um, was let in. And I just thought this is the most wonderful place I'd ever been. They, they, <coughs> they welcomed me and there were books, many beautiful books, and the environment was absolutely fantastic. And I, um, I just thought like, this is where I, you know, a museum, a library and a museum, this is the kind of place I want to be. And reading was an absolute passion. So I went off to university and I came back and I, um, got a job in a sex shop actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, temporary. <laughs> and then um, through sheer persistence managed to get a, a sort of a, a lowly post at the VA. And I had a, a, a good few years, but I something I think maybe at the time, this is ages ago, maybe the VA wasn't quite ready for me or I wasn't ready for VA. So I went off to art college and had an incredible time and and then, but when I came back to the V&A, I did sense that there was change in the air and there was an awareness that um, visitors, you know, they wanted more visitors. And just sort of thought, I can do that. And the very first thing I did when I started was to get um, live fashion into the museum. And of course, by then I've become fascinated with character and identity, mainly through novels, and about how you understand people through the dress, the symbolism, and um, you know, ju just just the idea of, you know, whenever I went to a museum, I always went to look at the, the dress and costume. I felt as if I could almost pick up the characters through the clothing. Mm -hmm. And so I started this thing called Fashion in Motion where I invited designers in to sort of walk around um, the, the museum with, with models dressed up and, you know, the hair and, and the makeup and absolutely everything. And the first one I did was with Philip Tracy, and we put little cameras on the um, the, the millinery, so there would be sort of astonished visitors looking at um, you know these apparitions. The next one I did was with Alexander McQueen, and it got a bit out of hand. Um, it was a riot, really, but it was just so exciting. And I thought I've got to work with this guy. And a couple of years later, I did a show called Radical Fashion, and he and many other you know, wonderful designers took part in it. And, and I just sort of realised that from being a sort of quiet, um, <clears throat> sort of quiet, scholarly type of person, actually I was sort of, you know, I, I just loved opening the museum up to people. Yeah. And I love sharing and that's where I am now. I love doing exhibitions. I, I just love it so much, everything about it. And I feel, that it's really thrilling and exciting. The, not only the journey I go on from sort of perhaps knowing not a lot about the, you know, the subject or not as so much I would like to know, but then sharing that process of learning with mm. people and then you know opening the show and you know my God the, it, it must be like a first night or something. You know when you open the doors to 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 an exhibition that you're thrilled about and people like it. There is no you know it makes up for everything or the late nights and everything. So, so that's why I do it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I didn't have the sort of focus that a lot of people have. Um, when, I was a, when I was growing up, I, I thought I wanted to go to catering college. Yeah. Um, but, I, but, I was all, but I was just interested in a lot of things. And one of the things I was very interested in was dressing up and dressing up myself and my friends. And um, <clears throat> I should have worked out at a, at a much younger age that costume design and theatre design would be a really great direction, but I, it took me a long time to work it out. I ended up in Blackburn College doing an art foundation course, thinking that I wanted to do textile design, and quickly worked out that that was very dull. I was designing duvet covers for 13-year-old <laughs> girls, thinking this isn't what I want to be doing. And um, 
I got steered by a really brilliant painter into the fine art department and realised that actually this is much more me um, and went to a really brilliant art school called The Ruskin which was a really conceptually driven brilliant uh, place where we were encouraged to just you know explore ideas and it wasn't technical at all and I spent the whole time making costumes, making work which was really informed by the history of dress and fashion and creating worlds and characters and making films and doing art performances and often I would be the central character in them. Um, and then I came to live in London and really was utterly useless, just spent, eight, spent, a, spent a few months temping in, a, in an ad agency and a friend said, you need to sort yourself out and here's a job in The Guardian for costumers at this place called Angels, the Costume House, which some of you might have heard of. And at the time, they were recruiting 10 costumiers to, um, to be trained as ladies. And uh, as you know, specifically, I was being trained as a ladies' period costumer. And for quite a while, I went into work every day and sorted out the clothes that had come back from films and theatre shows. And I had to date them all for, <clears throat> for my boss so that um, they could, you know, to be sure that they would go back in, in the mind. Place. It was a bit. It was. It was tedious, actually, but it was also <laughs> a really good way to learn yeah. about the history of clothes. Um, and at the time, I was going out of the theatre designer, so I used to come home and he would be doing all of these really interesting projects. And I was a bit jealous because <laughs> I was sorting out gloves and pairing socks and things, and <laughs> finding. Um, but but actually, what 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 I was doing was learning in a, in a very detailed way about about clothes. And it's that period, actually, of working at Angels where I, I sort of, you know, acquired a sort of skill, really, for particularly working with old, old clothes. Um, but I was finding it a bit, you know, after a while I got really sick of working there and um, was going to see loads of theatre and thinking, oh, this is much more interesting. So I left and went to do an MA programme at Larbon, so I was very interested in dance and did a design at a scenography course, which was great fun. D d didn't learn so much, but it was just a really good break. <laughs> and, and put my portfolio in for the Limbu Prize, and then sort of set myself up as a, as a person who kind of made my living really from assisting costume designers in the film industry, um, whilst doing fringe theatre, you know, when I could afford to do it. And um, and that's how it went for years, and then and then eventually I started designing my own films as a costume designer, and doing theatre projects, and 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 I've sort of built up this. I I, I you know I work between film and theatre and dance, and mainly do costumes, and sometimes I do uh, set design as well. But I just sort of real. I, I just sort of I, when I was at art school, I wish someone had said to me at the time. You, you should be you should be doing theatre design because it was so apparent to me from the sort of work that I was making that it would have been a really good thing to be doing. Not not that I regret doing that wonderful course; it was brilliant. But you end up in often in the right place eventually. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. love. Peace then. I I've always kind of pinpointed the moment I wanted to be whatever it is I am now, from the school trip when I was about eight or nine. We came to London, I grew up in Plymouth, which is um, back then not famed for its theatre. It had a tiny little theatre on the Hoe, which is, looks out over the, the water. And um, it's like a Nissen hut, or a couple of Nissen huts that were strung together. And we used to go there every year, me and my sister, on our birthday and because we're twins, uh, um, and watched Panto. So that was my real, and I loved it, I absolutely loved it. And I always wanted to go up on stage when the song sheet came down, and <laughs> not to sing the song, but to look at what was happening, at, you know, in the wings and stuff. Um, but we went on a school trip, and part of the school trip to London was um, to see Oliver, which was obviously uh, not the original production, not that, <laughs> but it was, it was a revived version of the original production. So it was what is now a very famous piece of theatre design um, by Sean Kenny, um, in its day uh, groundbreaking, actually. Um, 
and beautiful. And I just sort of watched this show and thought, I don't know. I'm not even sure I consciously thought it. I just came away and thought, I don't know what that, whatever that is, whatever I have just seen mm -hmm. there, that's what I want to do. I don't know what it is. And, you know, things, it's incredibly difficult to find out back then what what it actually was and the fact that it's kind of two jobs really as Katrina was saying I mean in America they're not stupid in America they are two completely yeah. different jobs <laughs> what's interesting is that we in this country have grouped them together and I don't quite know why but I'm glad because I wouldn't I find it very difficult to do not both of them um, so that thing became my goal and costume really wasn't a part of it it was I didn't understand that the costume bit of it was you know, a whole other bit. It was the, the set, obviously, for me, because that's where it physically started. And I just read, I just, you know, went back to Plymouth and bought the three books that existed um, and, you know, just read every single page and um, devoured stuff. My school couldn't help me because they didn't know what I wanted to, you know, I explained this thing, but nobody really knew because <laughs> there weren't any courses and there yeah. was nothing. There was absolutely... So, they let me do stuff in the art room and make models and just, you know, and I did. I, I did a whole module, as they call them now, on my A-level about theatre design when nobody else could help me. I was just doing it myself. Mm -hmm. And um, and then designed a school play and I, my English teacher was brilliant and really supported me and my art teacher was brilliant. But in the end, they just went, well, we don't have a channel for this. What you really want to be is an architect. <laughs> okay, I'll be an architect then. So I thought, there's no chance I'm going to get any grades, so that's fine, it's not going to happen. So I happily filled in all the forms and um, found myself at architecture college oh. in September of whenever, um, thinking, this is not what I wanted to do. This is absolutely not. So I stayed in London, that was in London, so I stayed in London for a term and just went to the theatre all the time <laughs> and then discovered that there were some courses actually were well, four I think courses that existed that called themselves theatre design none of which wanted me thank you very much um, <laughs> so I went to university and studied theatre studies which it was an academic degree um, which is brilliant I mean it was really interesting to be able to read around the subject for three years but while we were there, we had the most brilliant drama society and me and my friends basically took it over and just did shows and did them and did them and had huge ambition um, and, you know, surprised everybody. And it was just brilliant. And really, that was the kind of the blossoming moment of me going, OK, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, subsequent to that, I went to the Bristol Vic for a year and did a course thinking if I'd come away from this course with one contact, it will have been worth that extra year. And I did. It's a whole other story. And, um, uh, and so I ended up working for a designer and just carried on. And I was, you know, finally discovered that costume was a part of it and that if I wanted to get anywhere in this country anyway, early on, you kind of have to be able to do both, or at least it's much easier if you do both. So I had to force myself to learn, and I'm still learning every day, um, what that is. So uh, that's me. It's incredible. I love that I know you people. <laughs> um, and it's also incredible that there's no one route in, in this kind of work, that it seems to be a mixture of compulsion and wanting and needing to be part of making something and finding your way to it like a magnet somehow through trial and error and by doing things and so oh, I'm not waiting for something to happen I'm going to make it happen we're going to take over the drama society we're going to make work we're going to do something quite punk and turn up and put camera you know we're going to do it mm -hmm. and I think that's really exciting mm -hmm. to hear um talking about the beginning because you said that you know when you you don't necessarily know everything there is to know when you begin a project and obviously everyone's doing slightly different things but in process where do you begin and that's something I wanted to ask you maybe there's a particular example that you could use but where what are the first steps when getting to talking about the title of tonight finding a character how do you get closer and closer to that person and how is it different between a mannequin mm. or a model and an actor um, 
So that's what I'd like to ask. The first steps, should we? My first steps are uh, completely de really depend on what the project is. So um, what, if the project's a film, for example, thinking it's thinking of recent think work, um, I, I do I do a lot lot of um, research, photography and painting, depending on whether photography existed at the time of, of the, the of the story. And, and I just accumulate vast amounts of research and, and, and want to see want to see clothes and but ma but mainly I want to see real people and to see them um, in their lives and yeah so that so, so that that would always be my my first point of contact and and, and then you know if the project is is, is um, more more sort of conceptual or more abstract um, art contemporary art. Is, is, is where I go to for ideas, for inspiration. Um, but it starts with gathering, just gathering and loads of visual references, loads, loads of stuff, and finding out, you know, all about the world in which the project is, and, and the things. It, it's so different depending on you know on what it, it is. Obviously, it's a, it's a kind of a nonsense dance piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 let's say, um, I, let's say it w it was a film set in the nineteenth century. Then um, I would be immersing myself in the world of, of painters and photographers and finding out about, about how people lived uh, and therefore how they dress themselves. Mm. Yeah, great. Very different world. Yes. But I mean, I'm not normally portraying characters through the mannequins. So, so if I have a, if I do a group exhibition, then. The mannequins are performing a function, which is to provide an internal physical structure for the for the garments. And yes, the mannequins might be chosen um, to suit the tenor of the show. And then, with mannequins, you have a lot of challenges about um, posture, size, hands, heads. You know, if you have heads, you have to have wigs, and do you have wigs? Do you, do you have? Makeup. I mean, we we tend not. I mean, I tend to sort of abstract the the figure. Mm. So I'm not um, I'm not representing the character of the designer through the mannequins or the wearers. It's very rare for us to create a sort of replica uh, woman who who might have worn the garment. We might allude to it, but. But an interesting thing happened in the McQueen show because the the mannequins had to have more ferocity than usual. And we worked very, very hard to um, source some mannequins that, that were distressed and where, where they looked as if they'd been kicked around in his studio. And the, the, the problem is always the features and the faces. A lot of McQueen's catwalk shows featured women who are masked in, for many complicated psychological reasons. McQueen's relationship with the women who were wearing his clothes, both both on the catwalk and um, in real life, was was it was a complicated uh, thing going on. So the masks, which were made by Guido, had a had a kind of power, and and informed a certain sense of alienation which was very much part of McQueen's aesthetic. And we used different masks in different sections, uh, and they range from sort of metal masks to leather masks. But right at the end of the exhibition for his final finished collection, which was called Plato's Atlantis, which was about um, a, a sort of rather sort of um, biblical tale of, of he, he always imagined stories. Each collection had a story. And in this one, there was a great flood, and in order to adapt, uh, humankind had to mutate and become uh, half half reptile, would take take on the prop properties of of, um, of animals that could live beneath the water. So he described it sort of reverse evolution, and so we commissioned some mannequins which were alien-like. They they were extremely expensive. We only we needed a very small number, and they were moulded and then cast in a sort of mirrored reflective material and they were very stretched so their all their features were stretched and they were very strange and beautiful and powerful and you know incredibly tall 
because it seemed that no stockman or dressmaker's figure or shop mannequin could ever do could that. possibly yeah. do that. So you know, very unusual. But we did we did actually design, customize, and, and, and create these these very strange mannequins. But you know, very I mean, sort of eight feet tall. And that we needed that impact at the end of the show. But it's like casting an actor. <laughs> <laughs> or more complicated. Yeah. That's great. And so, Katrina, process and first steps? And um, yeah, I think, I think uh, definitely I have this kind of eclectic, just like a magpie, just gathering lots and lots of different um, material, you know, imagery uh, that just somehow has a sort of emotional resonance to me you know I think for me I, I'm always sort of searching for the the emotional narrative in a piece and mm. and how that you know uh, the tone that that you know the tone I think often when I go and meet a director or something you know you're having conversations all the time with different people the director mainly at the beginning and what I really want to know is the tone of the piece that they're trying to create because that then kind of gives me a sense of the sort of emotional world I might be um, dealing with. And and I think that's what I'm always trying to find, that emotional story and as a whole, but also, you know, then through the characters. And the other thing that I get sli slightly obsessed by, whether it's with set or costume, is because li theatre is this live thing that unfolds in front of you in live time, it's the fluidity of it. So the fact that, you know, it has to... I really want to know the transitions. I want to know, you know, how we're going to move from one place to the other and what that means. And, you know, and in costume, that very much means the tracks that this, you know, the actors are going to, if they're playing multiple people or, or you know, the, the scenes that that character is in. And somehow that kind of map helps me as well, kind of um, sort of maybe condense and reduce down what the final... Uh, elements I might use are um, because it's practical or because no, it's, I think it's got a journey yes because I, I want the journey to be fluid I don't want it to feel clumsy up, and yeah. I'm kind of trying to imagine as an audience when you're looking at this picture that's kind of moving in front of you in real time that it's that your brain can kind of go with it it, 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 you know, the brain isn't sort of going. Oh, hang on a minute! I don't didn't Believe understand that oh, okay. like that sort of change. Or um, yeah, does that make sense? And uh, yeah, yeah. So those are the things that I get obsessed by. Actually, is the kind of emotional narrative or the kind of world that we're trying to create, the tone of it, how fluid it can be, and how how it can unfold. And I tend to with costume. I don't tend to necessarily. I'm never very, I suppose my, my initial response isn't necessarily literal and I don't tend to do lots of different costumes. I tend to kind of think of character and try and kind of make them quite iconic, maybe through the piece. Mm. But because I, I, find, I think an audience maybe needs that at certain points just to be able to follow the story. Maybe that's just me being simplistic. <laughs> Thank you, and Peter. I was so interesting hearing yeah. all of you talking about the process and go, hang on, that's how I work. That's, and I didn't think I, well, sort of a lot of what Katrina was saying, just in terms of the mathematics of it or the coding of it and things like that, that are just things that in my head just go on subliminally. So I have a process that I guess over the years has just become the way I work, which I just thought I did, I thought I'd invent it, I can't be happy it. <laughs> but I was going to say, I can't do anything specific about costume. I mean, re research and stuff I can do, obviously, as part of the initial bit of the project. But until I know what the world is, so until I've really designed my set, I'm really reluctant to commit to the frustration of many directors, um, <laughs> to the... The, to what the costumes actually are because I know when I've got the world I've got all of those things going on in my head all of that time that I'm you know, designing the set and whatever and uh, uh, I, I kind of have this and I touch it's all wood isn't it <laughs> touch wood that, that that instinct will all, will never let me down so you get to the end of it and go okay now I know now I know what this should be it should be or whatever but 
Dur so during that process, it's all been going on in my head. And I'm thinking, is it colour? Is it not colour? Is it tone? Is it texture? Is it? And like very much like Katrina, I've done a kind of breakdown of just the patterns of things, so I can see also where big things happen in the show and where long things happen in the show. Where you have a big scene that has to last a long time, you kind of go, okay, well, you know, that's got to sustain that bit of this piece has to sustain you know it's 10 pages long whereas this bit although it's very big is two pages long and just it all becomes like everything like the Chemistry. set design as well it becomes like solving a puzzle mm. and I really love that bit at the end of it when you commit to the costumes to paper or or even when you don't when you're hiring and go to the high houses or whatever that in your head you've got a language that says okay we're going to do this with a limited color palette or that person's going to be like that just I guess making rules for myself that that help me to get to a point. It, it doesn't always work. Sometimes you get halfway through and go, oh, that rule didn't work, did it? That's good. We've discovered something new about this. And something, you know, good comes of that. So I love the organicness of not just me doing it, but other people coming to join the party, including the people who have to wear the clothes and mm. saying, mm. I don't think that my character would wear yeah, that. Yeah, that's what or, I wanted to ask mm. about about where the actor might fit in mm. into the process. I think I... Not often. Not. Well, no, <laughs> often. It's really important, I think, to get to a yeah. stage where you're in the fitting. Or before, I mean, with a play that has real mm. costumes, I find that I'd let, if there's time, have at least one week's worth of rehearsal and then sit down individually with all of the actors and maybe the director, but often the directors don't busy. Really mind. <laughs> yeah, they're sort of busy directing the play. And just talk to them and say, what do you think your character would wear? Just in, or what sort of things would they, what sort of things wouldn't they? What do you like? What don't you like? What colours don't you like? What, you know, what sort of shoes do you want? You know, tell, you know, so that when we get to a fitting, all of that's been cleared out. You're not doing that in, you know, in, in you know, while somebody's standing in their underwear, really. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other times when it is basically, and I, this is my only classic example: is you know, an actor is cast as Humpty Dumpty, and he doesn't he doesn't want to wear the egg costume, <laughs> he doesn't want to sit on a wall, and he doesn't want to fall off a wall. The only three things Humpty Dumpty. Is <laughs> Sometimes you just have to say, put the costume on. <laughs> Not very often, though. Hell yeah. Do you, do you have anything to add about actors and uh, the process? Yeah, I think it's a very... I think I, I, I find that fitting process really crucial, actually. To, to, again, it depends on what the project is, because if it's something that's very designed, and you know, when you come to the fitting, often you're at, at, at a point of sort of... Or, you know, you're, it, it's, it means something very different, but... To, to a project where you're, you know, and it's often when you're working with real clothes that already exist, where the clothes that you've, f you know, you filled the space with in anticipation of the fitting, you know, it, the, the putting those, the putting of them together to create a, a wardrobe for a, for an actor can be such an exciting process um, if you've got it right, and and you know, you, you you might never know what which piece is going to become the iconic the thing, thing yeah. that's going to, um, you know, really tell, you know, really help them in, in, in finding their character and really help tell the story. So I, I, I found, you know, when I used to work, um, I used to assist a costume designer called Jacqueline Duran and she did, we worked on a few Mike Lee films and I found that process really exciting, but of course it's very different to yeah. working with a, a really theatrical language, um, you know, where you might be working with a very reduced colour palette or very particular shapes, but in, in naturalistic costume, um, you know, having meetings with the actors, talking to them in the third person and about, you know, about their, the, the character that they're creating and then going out into the world, you know, almost as them and, and, and finding things is, is quite, an, I don't know how to describe it, but it's um, a sort of transference of, um, of, of, of that character, you know, into yourself. I, I totally. often, I, 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 you know, it's a very, that's a very specific way of working, though, and it doesn't at all apply to everything that I do, anyway. Um, but, but, but a good fitting um, is definitely a, a, a collaboration, for sure. I mean, as a director, I find that 
designers are just like your partner in crime and without which it's a very lonely isolated imaginative process and it's the first time you can talk about the world and the people and I find it triggers so much my imagination just sitting and looking through all the things that everyone's magpie collected together and and it's it becomes a conversation because it's so collaborative and um, just even having you know I just think this is where the real talent is people that can actually put things together and draw and collect and and it's tangible and when I have in the rehearsal room like sketches on the wall like over there and stuff like that I feel subliminally it's you know we're, we're in a diving process and we're trying to get deeper and deeper and it just helps us immerse and it helps the actors and actors say that I mean it's a cliche now but actors don't really I don't think feel like spiritually they're connected completely to their character till they put something of their costume on or even in rehearsal costume it feels like the way they walk and move everything is so connected with what they're wearing so did you have anything to say about actors specifically in, in your process I mean I, I think I think generally they're really open actually and I think it's quite amazing how open they are to you know to you coming and going this is you know how I've been thinking about it and you know I mean we all have kind of issues or senses sense you know about ourselves that we don't necessarily want to present this and present that and so I think I just try to be I just try to listen actually and to just watch very carefully kind of you know in different situations whether it's in the rehearsal room or in fittings what what I can see that they're responding well to or what's making them feel awkward and um, but generally I'm amazed how kind of like open they are just to kind of go for it and, and uh, you know allow you to to um, put clothes on them and you know and help them visually create the character um, so I you know I think I mean it's, it is a dialogue but I, I think they they're really trusting actually mm. most of the time yeah and a word that everyone has repeated here is icons I just wanted to ask some of you how you work with an iconic character so <laughs> Katrina you had to um, on Harry Potter look at Hermione that was in everyone's imagination from the films in a certain way in the books and uh, I know that you're working on an I exhibition about Frida Kahlo mm -hmm. and people's impressions yeah. and nostalgia or ownership of that and how, how you work with that and your the image of <laughs> Lady Macbeth and even the poster image that Tom was talking about earlier is already iconic and so talking about that theme and, and Peter you've like and creating iconic images for groups and a palette of costume for not just one character but a group of characters together in a block and how that would work I wonder whether we could speak a bit about that do you want to kick off with Hermione in, uh, or, yeah, or Harry I mean, Potter in general? You know, for which you won a very large award, I think. <laughs> <laughs> which is casually by her sofa somewhere, <laughs> nonchalantly on the floor. I mean, I think, I mean, John Tiffany kind of had quite a clear sense of the type of piece he wanted to create with making a theatre piece um, around Harry Potter. And, uh, and I think his casting of Noma... Um, do 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 Menzi? Sorry, Noma de Menzi um, as Hermione was a big kind of like statement of intent actually. And uh, and Noma's I'd worked with Noma at the RSC. She's a fantastic actress. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's very elegant. She she you know, and John knows her as a, a as an actress. And and so he you know for him it was it was like he wanted Noma to play that part. Um, and Noma's a black actress, so, you know, visually, in, in the kind of wider arena of the world of Harry Potter, you know, this was kind of seen as slightly controversial. So, um, but, but it was a really strong kind of action that, that John had done. And, and so, you know, so already I kind of knew from, from that that, you know, that, that the way that Hermione was... was um, being told and the way we were going to tell all of this this story was very much our own way and um, and so I can't give too much away in terms of why she's wearing what she's wearing or the look of it but um, yeah I suppose I, I 
I kind of wanted, you know, the characters are all grown up. Um, so, uh, and she has a very particular path through the story. So I kind of uh, just wanted to represent that. And also, anyway, with the, with the whole world of it, you know, I had to have the balance between a sort of Hogwarts world that we all know and is in our consciousness, but also um, knowing how it was going to unfold on stage and the fluidity that it needed and um, and that we wanted to make it our own. It mm. is a piece of theatre. We didn't want to reproduce the films. We didn't, you know, it, the books lie in everyone's imagination. So. Um, I was sort of always sort of doing this sort of slight balancing act with that, you know, um, and and with with Hermione, you know, uh, very much built it around actually Noma in, in a way. I remember you saying, yeah. Kiki, I can put anything on her. Yeah, she no, looks Noma great. has got this. I mean, I remember this at the RSC. She's just one of these people who something about her proportions are just. She just you put stuff on her and it's it fits and it suits really. Really, really I'm not, it suits it suits her very well, and she carries it very well. And it's something to do with proportions. She can almost wear anything, and so I kind of because I'd known her, I knew I'd known her anyway, and I knew the world that we were trying to create as a piece of theatre. Uh, and through conversations with her, we sort of you know I'd done all the drawings, but we sort of tweaked little bits and you know, lengths of things and hair, how the hair was going to be. So, you know, once I'd kind of established a sort of uh, silhouette, in a way, of what I felt the character needed, um, then during the rehearsal process, Noma and I talked through that and then through the fitting process kind of made decisions on proportions and lengths of things and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was... It was built around Noma to a certain extent um, because I knew from before I designed it that she was going to be playing it. But you well. managed to balance between reinventing and doing something really fresh yeah. and then also having something distilled from the icon of Harry Potter. Yeah, I mean, I think I did that um, in the world of all of it. You know, that's what I was very conscious of. I had to, I didn't want to make it alien to people, but also it had to be very much its own thing. and. So that was what the balancing act was. Mm. Right. Yeah. And how about with Frida or any of the other famous people? Well, normally the, the exhibitions I do will be exhibitions about the work of fashion designers. So as I said, I'm not normally trying to recreate a character. Although my colleagues in the theatre and performance department do do that. Yeah. So they did the David Bowie exhibition, for example, and then the... Hollywood costume exhibition was based on um, film characters, actors. Well, it was it was sort of about the actors as film characters wearing the clothes that were shown, yeah. and they got around the the perennial problem of you know the mannequins never. I mean, they are funny old things, mannequins. So so they they projected the the, the moving faces onto um, sort of elements representing the face. And there have been other exhibitions in the past, in other museums, where people have tried to sort of characterise the, the identity of who the exhibition might be about. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, this is the first... I mean, I've done exhibitions where I've known who the client was who wore a certain garment. And so, for example, I, I did a show about Dior and Balenciaga and um, the, the sort of the great prison couturiers a few years ago. And we, we, I managed to acquire a dress that actually had been thought lost and it arrived in sort of absolute tatters. And we, um, we worked out who we thought had owned it. And we managed to contact the family and they brought a dress along, that it, was, it was quite a sort of well-known um, uh, person. And they brought along another one of her dresses and we took internal dimensions of the dress oh, and matched wow. them up to ours. And so we had a sort of reverse body there where we oh, had... Amazing. Because couture is made to absolute measure, no one is absolutely um, straight or, or, or symmetrical. So we could prove through sort of forensic science. And that's the other thing to say is that I don't just work alone. I work with a great team of remarkable people who, you know, conservators, costume dressers, researchers, scientists. You know, we we 
the museum was a great source of, of knowledge, both academic and research led, but also practically. So when it came, when it's now, we've been at the stage with Frida Kahlo where we are thinking very, very seriously about the mannequins. You know, how do you convey somebody like Frida who is so well known yeah. already? Her if face, I, you know. I mean, the whole, the, actually, the, I mean, the whole, the big, big searching question of the exhibition, there's always one, every exhibition I've ever done has, has, has had a challenge at the heart of it, and it varies. For, for us, the fact is that Frida is so well known already, but what we're bringing to the table is her clothing, and it's remarkable because it's never left, nobody even knew it existed until yes. 2004 when it was discovered, uh, hoarded, barricaded away in bathrooms in her house, been hidden by Diego Rivera um, into, uh, um, in, in 1954 when Frida died and was not to be opened until his death. He died not very long after, and the housekeeper said, it's not going to be opened until I die, and she lived for wow. you know, another <laughs> 45 years. <laughs> Remarkably. Wow. So the, it was all locked away for 50 years, and, and people had forgotten about it, or never knew. And so we're, we're bringing this costume from Mexico, and it's her very own garments. Mm. So. When we have done some trial runs, we've been putting them on mannequins, you immediately see, you get a glimmer of Frida. You begin to, to recognise the proportions, the, that distinctive... Um, she, she, she wore mainly Tawana dress, which is from a uh, regional dress from Oaxaca. And there are many complicated reasons why she wore that, but I won't give the yeah. entire game away. But what do you do? But as we begin to move the arms, and she had a very characteristic pose, which was sort of like that. Mm. Um, and there was another one where she, she smoked all the time, so, you know, she, there were other... And as we began to move the hands in position, we began to get a glimmer of her, mm. but we're not there yet. Hopefully we will be by next year. I can't <laughs> wait. But there seems to be such an ownership, like with Frida, like with Hermione. People have, you know, they feel like they own part of these people, and yeah. there's an enormous so responsibility yeah. with but also you need to be free to do... Yes, your own thing as well. Your, yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, um, yes. We're talking about um, so Fl oh, Florence, Florence Pugh. Florence yeah. Pugh. Yeah, Florence Pugh as Lady Macbeth. Um, so the, that, that image of her on that sofa, I think that's what we're talking about, yeah. isn't it? Um, uh, in the script, it, it existed completely differently in my head and it was described as being a grey silk dress huge grey silk Quinlan dress and uh, I thought the grey would be a bit boring really in this already quite sort of foul and house. <laughs> so um, I, I, just, I wanted to use the palette, um, the sort of iridescence of, of a crow wing, the palette so that's sort of changeable, so strong flashes of kind of poisonous colours, toxic greens, things that were sort of shifting all the time because she is a character who you know, has a lot of passion. I, I don't know if anyone's seen the film, but she, she, you know, she's a she's a young girl who um, is like a local nanny, really governess, and she she gets bought by this by this local um, colliery owner to be the wife um, of his son, so that so that she'll produce an heir. And she's not very very it's a very unhappy match, and so she's stuck in this house all day. Her clothes, I decided, would have probably be. I didn't think she'd have much control over. Um, what the, you know the style of the dress it was all going to be very in my head it, you know I created a bit of a story that you know they're so sting even though they had pots of cash they were quite tight and st you know it was high quality probably quite a high quality dress made in a local local town like um, Durham somewhere like that but but with no frill so I went down this kind of puritanical um, stylistic route and, and with these colours, and, and then with Florence Pugh, who I was sort of hoping, I actually thank God it was her, because she was brilliant, but I was hoping for this little waif, you know, with like a, it might be French or something, with pale skin, and when she <laughs> turned up, she was quite, you know, super tan, super, super <laughs> tan, just come up from a beef, covered in piercings, <laughs> with um, really dyed hair, and, and also, 
not negative, you know, very, sh- you know, oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I thought, <laughs> great, this isn't going to work. But, um, you know, we, we, she was brilliant and we dyed her hair to a sort of brownie organ, which was for her awful, <laughs> and got her to, sh- sort of, well, I'm not going to go into too many personal details, but got her to stop going on the sunbed and stop going out in the sun and to take <laughs> her piercings out and corseted the hell out of her and um, and she who well, she hated because in, in as a person she's incredibly um, free. free yeah free and super dynamic and and she just kept fainting <laughs> she hated being stuck in a corset which how was, which romantic was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's how we create, created her created book. but her. she was really amazing at committing to that so we did a lot of long fittings where yeah, yeah. Amazing. We got there in the end. Peter. What am I talking about? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just wondering. Everyone's talked about individuals, or you know, and whether you could talk about the chorus <laughs> yeah. and trying to make iconic images on mass. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's been lovely to hear all of those <coughs> things because I think you make a choice. You either go, I am. I think when you say there's a sense of ownership about all of these things actually yeah. um, sometimes I think it's really good to go okay I'm going to give you that bit I'm going to give you an Alice that looks a bit like Alice so that all the other people don't quite look like any other so that if I give you throw your bone then it allows me to do some other stuff it allows me to be or other times I just think oh what the hell in for a penny you all know what it is you, you will have an opinion about it anyway I just did a production of Wind in the Willows that most people didn't like very much but it, it and some of it was because we just made choices we've made choices that we're just like we're going to make it modern we're going to make it we're not going to and kids loved it it's mm-hmm. that everybody goes oh kids won't recognize it kids won't, yeah, yeah, yeah. kids won't know that's a weasel he says he's a weasel it's fine <laughs> <laughs> and that happens a lot in theater there's most people announce themselves anyway so there's a real you know it you can be really imaginative but the I guess the things you're talking about the, the shows that I've done that are have had previous lives that like revivals of musicals particularly that I sometimes wonder why I said yes to <laughs> and but but the, and, uh, which is a really good feeling I I, I uh, there are some things that I wouldn't do because I don't think I've got anything new to bring to them and, other th- and a few things I have done that I didn't think I had anything new to bring to and then realised I did and it was really exciting and they're the, I think the most exciting actually to sort of do the production of On the Town in the summer and I thought I've done a lot of things with a lot of colour and a lot of pe- and people say oh that's what he does and I'd kind of gone okay I'm not doing colour anymore that's uh, well, <laughs> I'm, not that anymore. I'm not doing it anymore and the director <laughs> said uh, director Korob said I want it to be like the most colourful thing I've ever done. Oh. Not I have done, <laughs> he'd ever done, which is, you know. Um, so I thought, right, I'm going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to like God. crank <laughs> up the colour to such an extent, like to an eye, you know, hot <laughs> thing. Yeah. And it's the one thing in the last, I don't know, five or six years that I've been really, really nervous about because I just thought, made the biggest mistake you forced me to do something I didn't want to do and now I've done it and now it's going to look horrible and the night before it all came on stage I was really also the, in terms of like making a show we limited the fabrics because I wanted them all to kind of hang the same and move the same because it was a big dance show so the men's suiting was pretty much one or two or three maximum different fabrics the women's dresses were nearly all the same fabric and no detail at all no nothing and um, I really, really panicked, and then it hit the stage, and I panicked slightly less. Also, it was hit the stage in daylight, which was really terrifying. <laughs> like, all these colours, I never want to say a matinee at this show. Um, by the time we got theatre lighting, it all kind of made sense. But I think it's the reason I do those things is to, in the end, go give the audience a kind of fresh look at something, which I think we're all talking about, really, is saying, we know this has been done before, but let's just tilt it slightly, one way or the other. I was interested to see what Claire was saying about the hands and thinking mm. what you feel about how much that covers up. Mm. In yes. a, uh, but anyway, we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll but, so yeah, it really just, 
the code demo, it's like, you know, we were talking about earlier, just, you know, playing games and coding and making, telling a story. I mean, in the end, it's really all about telling a story. Every one of these things is about how you let an audience go with you on a journey from the beginning and the end of it that makes sense. And I think costume does have a huge part to play in that. Mm -hmm. Right, well, it's your turn now. <laughs> um, for questions from the floor, it'd be great to hear from you. And uh, if you've got some questions, please put your hand up. Yes? Um, yes, I'd like to know how is your, your creative process when you're designing a costume, a dance piece, um, where uh, instead of having a text, you have a to work with sound and movement? Right, so. so creative process for dance and where there's no text but sound and music you've worked in dance yeah yeah, yeah. Um, um, to, to sort of immerse myself really in, in the music and in the, in the dance and 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 you know rather like what Katrina was talking about to sort of try and get a sense of what the emotional journey of the or language of pieces and and to sort of then start to find visual reference. I, I, I love contemporary art so I look a lot at, at a lot of it so I'm often drawn to contemporary art as a sort of real source of inspiration for particularly for projects that are more liminal and suspended and and less specifically set in any sort of time frame. Um, and it's through looking at that sort of work that I, you know, I get really excited about the possibility of creating something that is, you know, a, you know, it becomes something very much it, its own thing. Um, so it's so, yeah. So my process would be accumulating a very specific kind of research, and then kind of distilling it until it becomes something all of its own. <laughs> okay. In a, in a nutshell. I, I've had some. I, I I've always really loved the idea of designing the dance, and because because it could be more abstract and a bit you know freer. But somehow the dance pieces that I've I've designed have have mainly have more have more of a narrative with to them anyway. Um, and then one piece, um, which was a new piece, I didn't have any music or any choreography, <laughs> and I was thinking I was thinking. Let's do this. I don't have anything to kind of like hang it on, and that I find that really hard. You know, obviously really hard and quite strange. But but that isn't unusual either, actually, because you know, with a new piece, the music still is still being created, and the choreography uh, is being created, and they tend to do it in different. You know, they don't necessarily rehearse it all at one time. You know, they do it kind of spaced out throughout the year. So I remember with that one, I was very excited when I got the job, and then realizing that I didn't have much to hold on to. Um, that was quite, yeah, I, I, in the end I kind of approached it like I would approach most things where I kind of got a sense of, of the kind of world that we were trying to create and it did, have a, it did have a sort of narrative to it so, you know, it wasn't a completely abstract piece so I kind of just approached it how I would approach um, doing any, you know, piece of story. Um, and then and then decided to do some drawings and gather a whole load of images and just kind of really push them out into the choreographer and go, is this what you're meaning? You know, it's like, you just to try and see. Just if, point at yeah, something, will you? Yeah, which, and then he, and then he literally came back and said, I love all of them. Oh. <laughs> this is like, oh, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> but gradually we managed to kind of chip it still, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah, that was, um, so I don't feel like I've had my wonderful kind of abstract dance sort of piece yet. Moment yet. But yeah. But I, I do like I love I love I love watching dancers and I yeah, I do love that whole world actually. I think it's really there's something very liberating about it. Should we move on to another question? How do you kind of get your ideas from your head into reality? Do you sit down and draw it out, or do you get straight into the workshop and start playing around with materials? Peter? Or yeah, should we start? Oh, God. Uh, it's, if it's a major, like if, if I've had to draw a picture, and I'm not very good at drawing pictures, which is why I didn't get onto any of those courses. Not true. Um, then it's. Uh, 
it's a, it's a, you know, you draw your picture, you have the conversations. I mean, I imagine this is the same for quite a lot of us. And and then I suppose if it's a show, we find a world of fabric, and I, that's the bit I love, especially yeah. if it's a big show. I mean, last year I spent two months just fabric shopping for stuff and we couldn't really make anything sometimes if there's a set of costumes i wouldn't want to commit to any one fabric until i'd found all 12 let's say and go okay i want lots of checks but i don't want those checks i want those checks and so it's a bit like detective work it's really good fun and a bit of a nightmare and we were in paris and we had to come over to london and just anywhere i mean really anywhere in the world as well it's just sort of looking for the, I mean, I find it really frustrating, which I've stopped doing now, kind of designing something you think is a fabric that exists, but it only exists in your head, unless you have it printed. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so you spend like two weeks looking for it, and in the end you just have to go, it doesn't exist, move on, which may affect a whole bunch of other stuff. But that's the fun of it, I think, is to just kind of go, okay, what's the fabric? How does it relate to everything else? I'm not sure if I've answered the question, but that's my bit. Great. Does any, is anyone burning oh, to respond to that? Gonna, uh, yeah, I was going to say that I can't do the drawing until I've got some things in the space. I, I need to get stuff in, in the space, and even if it's just stuff from my crappy costume collection, which could just be any old thing, just to, it's why I love R&D so much. That I always feel like the best work comes when you've had the opportunity to do research and development months in advance of the actual, um, really, before you've really got going, when you can just bash out ideas in the most rudimentary way and it's like being a child and you're playing and I feel that my best stuff in theatre has come from having that process and then going from that and then making costume designs or set designs from what we've learned in, in that kind of haphazard world of play. We could probably do with one more question, I'm sorry we're running, yeah. You said earlier that the um you felt this was a kind of the powerhouse of uh, ideas. So I think it's something like that, you said, where <laughs> the ideas are, are generated, which I would agree with. And it's clear that design is often at the heart, the conceptual heart of a, of a production or a film. Why is it then, do you think, that in the media, when anybody is asked to speak about theatre mm. or film, inevitably the people asked to speak are actors or directors? I wonder why they... So oh, they like the sound of their own voices. I don't know. <laughs> With the exception of it's DNA, I would say. Would, yeah, would it's true. Curation is a slightly different thing. I think people understand that yes. curation is a conceptual at the heart of the yes. event, but not so in theatre and film, no. I feel. I think that's why. absolutely right. And it's so <laughs> funny because, I mean, at the beginning of a rehearsal process, it's the first day traditionally you you know you talk about your vision as the director and the next thing that happens before the s scripts read is you share the model box and all the costume ideas on the wall or whatever you know and so at that point everyone's holding on for any kind of tangible idea or uh, key into the world of the of the play and then um I've only made one film, but I was just like, the costume was at the, so much of the centre of that because I felt it was like a walking set. Everything happened for me on the body and, and in a way that I've never felt that way in theatre. So it felt, feels like it's central, but you're right, in the world, in the ether. But even that model is outdated. It might have been a designer who was the person who came up with the conceptual key on the piece rather than the director. Yeah. Or it might have been a conversation between them, which it probably was. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, absolutely. But that is really credited, I think. And it's I so. Why. I, I wonder why. And I think it's. That, it, it's you're absolutely right. Whenever we're um, making or made a piece of work at the National Theatre, you should. I mean, maybe sometimes. Have you guys been asked to speak? But I, I, I I'm always why. asked, or leading actors ask. But, but sometimes. Is, I mean, there's, there's lots of conversations. Go, there are lots of conversations going on around this topic at the moment, actually, and um, and I think it's just I think it's just slightly old-fashioned mm. kind of approach. You know, there's a sort of old-fashioned hierarchy that it's the kind of the director is the auteur of everything, and you mm. know, and I, I think it's just that um, 
in the wider world, I think within the industry we know it's not like that, but in the sort of wider world and definitely with critics, I think they don't, you know, they don't they haven't thought past that level yet, you know, and, and um, I think it's up to all of us to kind of, mm. you know, that's why this event is This fantastic. is so important. And exactly. yeah, it's important that um, all the people who work, because we all work in mm. collaboration, you know, I, we have teams of people on every level and um, it's really important that that's understood actually. And, uh, you know, we did, we were very mindful of this and I think it's a good question because I, I'm the spokesperson for the project, but uh, for McQueen, we created something on the website where we asked all the people who'd worked on the show, and there, I think during you know, the last few weeks, something like maybe 100 um, staff in various capacities are working, and we asked people to talk about objects, and for us, the object is the source of, uh, the, the source of everything. It's where it all begins. It doesn't begin... With, with the person, mm. uh, that's where we do differ, but in many ways we, so many things are similar. Um, and so we, we, we just recorded and filmed people talking to objects. And the, the, we had been working with a, a very quiet technician, uh, object handler, you, you have trained object handlers, their job is actually to move objects around. And that's the beginning and the end of, uh, end of it. I mean, it's a skilled job, but it's, it's not particularly expansive. But he started speaking about this one particular object, and I, I just, I, I was so moved. He, he, he was so thoughtful. He, he understood it, and it was very lyrical. And I, I looked at the object with, with fresh eyes. And if we hadn't, if it hadn't occurred to us to, to, to record these um, mm. experiences of, of working on that exhibition, we would have never known what he had to say about it. So. You know, my, my view is that everybody who's involved in a production or a, an exhibition has a sense of ownership. It's not just mm. the, you know, the more visible people. Mm. And certainly at the v every single person I work with cares terribly about their bit of it. Mm. So you get this most sort of beautiful kaleidoscope, but too often their voices aren't heard. Absolutely. I mean, I agree. And I think that's why this forum and, you know, things like Katrina being part of the associates at the National and that we bring, you know, all artists to the fore because then yeah. people realise how it's always a collaboration, whatever medium we're in, mm -hmm. that it's so, you know, that's how we make the work. I mean, it's crazy. You're absolutely right that it's not. Uh, celebrated. I think um, also um, people are sometimes a bit scared <laughs> of visuals. You know, like, yeah. I remember I did a talk uh, years ago, and Michael Billington was the person after me, and we had lunch together just because we were both in the same building. And you know, we were talking about stuff, and I said, you know, w often designers feel really kind of upset because a lot of their work gets attributed to directors and you know as if they're completely invisible you know you're talking about you know these wonderful worlds created by you know directors mm. when actually it's it's been the collaboration with the designers and he said he feels he said at the time he felt very unsure about his knowledge of visuals and so he felt slightly intimidated by that and that was why he didn't he couldn't discuss right it about it yeah, yeah. and That's so you know I think I think there is a sort of mystery around what it is to be visual and, and actually so that kind of just needs to be... It's very interesting. Guys, I'm going to get into so <laughs> much <laughs> trouble. <laughs> Tom's been giving me daggers for about <laughs> half an hour. The women who write about <laughs> theatre now get it much more than the men. Mm. Oh, why I is think. that? I don't know. I just think they, they understand the vocabulary, it yeah. seems to me. Much more. Mm. I agree. Mm. Well, I, I think we could talk all night, <laughs> but thank you so much. Can we all just celebrate? <laughs>